Welcome to my podcast, Esteemed Women. It used to be called Silence and then it became Innovation. And now finally women are more empowered than ever to use their voices to express what it's really like to strive and thrive in what tends to often feel like a very male-dominated world. I'm sure it hasn't been easy, but these women have achieved and accomplished. They truly are esteemed women who have chosen careers in science, technology and innovation. They're typically go-getters, alpha females, hardworking and maybe even a little bit perfectionistic. But on the whole, they've applied their talents and skills to really make a difference. That was certainly my own intention when I was working as a mechanical engineer and fluid dynamicist. In these episodes, you'll get a chance to hear about some fascinating innovations, but you're also likely to be inspired and uplifted by the personal stories and experiences of my amazing guests. So let's hear it for my STEM sister, Fiona McGarry, an incredibly esteemed woman and STEM's engagement manager. Hi, I'm Fiona McGarry. I'm the engagement manager at Make UK. So I'm responsible for attracting more young people to STEM and engineering careers. So I run our STEM room and I do other campaigns just to spread the word about engineering and manufacturing roles. What an absolutely vital role you have. I think we need to be best friends um, because I'm really aligned with um, your mission to try and get more people into STEM. Um, do you have a STEM background yourself? Yeah, so I started, um, I did psychology at uni and then I did a master's in computer science. And then after that, I taught um, IT to young people who'd been excluded from school. And then I fell into manufacturing. So there was a vacancy at Jaguar Land Rover for their education centres. I went along not thinking it would be for me and absolutely fell in love with manufacturing and engineering So that was about 18 years ago. So since then, I've been heavily involved within manufacturing and engineering and working with young people to encourage them into the sector. You know, manufacturing is a chapter in my book, and I really see how far um, manufacturing has come and how much it's changed over the decades. Yeah, I mean, it's. And it is, it's not a very diverse sector. It's probably one of the least diverse sectors within engineering. And that's what we're having to work on. Only um, 29% of the workforce within the whole of manufacturing is female, which is massive. And less than 10% of engineers and technicians come from an ethnic minority background. So there's a lot of work to be done. And there's a lot of work being done over the last 15 years. And it's been slow, but I am starting to, in the last couple of years, see a change because... People are understanding that it's not this dirty, horrible, male-dominated, dirty place, that there's lots of exciting digital AI and it's really progressing and the environment is really supportive of getting more people into it. Why is it important to have diversity in manufacturing? Particularly within manufacturing because customers ultimately are going to be from a diverse background. So you need people who understand what that customer Needs. So within Jaguar Land Rover, you need p- designers to be female as well, because if all the designers are male, it was quite funny when the F-Type came out 12 years ago. Um, one of the HR ladies sat in her F-Type and pulled down the um, compact, the mirror, and there was no mirror there. And then but no one had thought of it about it because men were designing the car and they hadn't thought about the fact that you'd want that little mirror there just to... And I know that's a very female thing, but it's you need female within females within the process to understand what females require, just like you need the whole, you need everybody represented so that everyone understands what different niches that people require within products. So you it's really absolutely really need a mirror in the passenger seat and the driver's yeah. seat. And she pulled it down and they're like, well, we hadn't thought about that. So yeah. This is the moment when you get to your destination or when you're leaving. Uh, where you need to absolutely do that yeah. check. Yeah. So, gosh, what a terrible uh, thing to over over. But it's just an example of the fact if you've not got everyone involved in the process, they're not going to think about little quirks or little things that suit that particular customer. Absolutely. If, if a, a company thrives far more if it's got diversity within its workforce. It's you know you need that representation. 
I mean, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, and actually, I'm pleasantly surprised that 29% of manufacturing is female, because that is so much more um, than representation in mechanical engineering, which I think yeah. is now 15%, but it was 12% when I was studying um, about two decades ago. So things have improved, but there's still um, a long way to go. Um one thing that really stands out in your kind of mission is this idea of getting more people into engineering who don't necessarily come from a conventional, what we assume is an engineering background, which is doing maths and physics A-level, yeah. that kind of thing. Um, where do you stand on the importance of apprenticeships versus degrees into engineering? See, I'm very biased. I'm totally pro apprenticeships. So, and also not necessarily degree apprenticeships because predominantly what we deliver at our centre, 75% is level two and level three apprenticeships. And I just think it's a real great gateway for young people because they're not necessarily that academic that, you know, can do the maths, can do the physics. They're not wired that way. But when you give them something to do with their hands and creativity and problem solving, they're absolutely brilliant. And I think if we focus too much on that degree route, we're missing out on a lot of the young people that, you know, could come into the sector and then can progress onto a degree afterwards or just stay. Because you also need the people who will just stay and do. And that's the thing. We work with a lot of big companies, but then we work with a lot of SMEs and they need that level three worker they need that someone to come in and do the role and be responsible for that part of the job and not necessarily be within management, but doing the role, but be skilled within that role. There's a massive shortage, shortage of welders in this country. We can't get welders and you can't attract young people to welding because they think that is dirty and horrible. But a lot of our apprentices as part of their pathway when they come and do their apprenticeship with us have to do a section on welding and they absolutely love it. And it's fantastic and they can create and, you know, they're responsible and it's brilliant. But I think until you showcase that to a young person, they would never consider it. Yeah, I, I really, I really get what you're saying, because only a few weeks ago I tried welding for the first time. Oh, right. And it's so interesting, the process that happens when you actually start using your hands. Yeah. Is that you go from, you know, got to think, got to come up with ideas, you know, got to use my brain. And and I have been very focused when it comes to engineering, like really um, academic. Yeah. And then the minute I started welding, um, it just was like this letting go, you know, like it was, it was, it was this sense of, wow, I can be creative. Um, I need to make sure I'm being safe. Like I was really present in the moment. And it was like all of my core skills could actually be unleashed because sometimes I feel very trapped in my brain. Yeah. And I don't actually get to engage the rest of me in my work. And I think that's what I love about apprenticeships is that people who don't, aren't, necessarily all in their head yeah. can actually apply themselves more fully because we get young people at 16 so some of those young people at 16 if they do a level they could do a level two if they've not got their English and maths and we support them with functional skills but some of them have got their English and maths the required uh, qualifications and do the level three so we've got 340 first years at the moment I'd say 70 percent of them are between 16 and 18 but then we've also got some career changes. So some young, some people, young adults, they're 25, 26, disillusioned with what they're currently doing. And they come along and do an apprenticeship. We actually had a young man from Scotland who'd done a degree in engineering. And then he got a job with Rolls Royce down here and did an apprenticeship. And he said he wished he'd realised at the time because it is only becoming more acceptable these days for an apprenticeship. But that was a much better way for him to learn and be an engineer, being hands on and rather than being in the classroom and learning the theory, because they come to us for a year and then they go back to company and they're applying all those different skills they've learned. And then 
being supported within industry by people within industry and they really flourish yeah I mean all the apprentices in my book that I interviewed they are having a fantastic life like I'm not denying that um it must be incredibly hard work to be doing the theory alongside yeah. being in the industry. I mean, you're basically living two lives at one time and that can be really, really stressful. But what you get as a result of that investment of really hard work and focus is that you get loads of industry experience. You don't have a student debt. Yeah. And many of the apprentices that I've spoken to who are kind of in their 20s, um, already have mortgages and things like yeah. that their own car yeah, you know. the car park they've got better cars than the rest of us particularly because we do a residential model as well so the brick factories all send their apprentices to us and they stay in a hotel monday to friday all covered so they're not spending anything and they're earning this money and yeah it is it yeah it is hard and it is taxing at times trying to get everything done but then there's a lot of reverse mentoring that goes on so when they're back at site They've got all these new skills and knowledge and they're able to educate the older workforce on some of the skills that they've learned. Particularly I mean, lean manufacturing is one of the um, units they do. And they can go back and really apply that back at factory and, you know, educate everybody else. And they really then feel they're valued. I mean, honestly, these apprenticeships are a powerful form of education. Um, and, you know... My heart does go out for teachers because um, teachers in schools are so overloaded and, you know, there's there's a lot going on with um, what teachers want, uh, what they feel they deserve and what they do deserve and, and, and what they take on. Um, and with all of that, you know, I don't know how effective the educational system is for engineers because engineers are so practical. You know, even if you go down a very academic route, engineers all love to design and build and create and innovate. And and so um, I have a little bit of a soft spot for apprenticeships, even though I didn't do it myself. I think maybe if I had, um, my career may have turned out very differently. So I'm in full celebration of what you're supporting. Um, And, you know, I hope we get to meet more apprentices going forward. Um, In terms of your own experience, um, what is computer science? Because I've heard it many, many times, and I'm sure I may have even done a module on it when I was studying, but I don't really know what it encompasses. It sounds quite intimidating, computer science. Yeah, so it's about, so it's over 20 years ago I did it now. So when I was doing it, it was a lot of coding, a lot of Java coding. And it was just something I did after my psychology degree. But I realised at the time, sitting in front of a computer and coding wasn't for me. So that's why I went into teaching young people about IT instead. But um, it is, it is, it was probably the hardest year I've ever done. But um, but yeah, very interesting. And then it's moved on loads since then. But yeah. Well, coding does seem to be the language of the future. Yes. Yeah. Um, in some countries, they are saying that coding should be um, mandatory, um, maybe even n- not replacing, but going head to head with languages like French and Spanish. Yeah. yeah. And I can see that. Um, But coding just looks so intimidating. Um, What has been your experience with young people and their interest in learning how to code? They're much more, it's their kind of world, isn't it? That's the thing. So there's Vex Robotics, which is the competition that's run um, with primary school children. Primary school children are just because they're far more used to computers and everything these days, aren't they? And they can get coding and work with coding so much better. So a lot of the apprentices that come in through to us, they can do coding. And we do a robotics module as part of their pathway. And they are fantastic at it because it's just second nature to them. Whereas I think for us, it's, you know, it came to us later. 
but then the, often the tutors are having to teach them because that's another issue within our sector is finding tutors. Um, it's alien to them as well. So young people, I think, within coding, they are flourishing. Wow. So actually the obstacle may be adults. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because maybe as, let's just say, um, older people, we are applying or maybe projecting our intimidation of this language onto younger people and younger people are like, what's the issue? Yeah. To them, it's simple. It's easier than a foreign language sort of thing. It's, yeah, it's, it's the way forward. And there, there's so many young people that are coding and doing different and amazing things. So, um, but yeah, it just feels like it's just second nature to them. I wonder whether there are young people listening to this going, yeah, you just have to go on YouTube and just learn the first few steps. It's super easy. Like, you know, because I do find that there is a bit of a barrier. I mean, you know, there are so many different social media platforms, for example, and all of them work slightly differently. Um, but you see a sort of Gen Z person just flipping between the different platforms with ease. Um and so maybe it is a generational thing where there's a bit of a sort of like resistance to the uptake of this digital transformation that we are in the middle of. Well, the number one search engine for Gen Z is TikTok. So that is where they're going to for all their information. So that's where they're going for their careers advice. That's where they're searching for information. So that's why we're working really hard with the manufacturers that we work with to get them to embrace TikTok. But for our age group, it just feels very alien. So we are doing a lot of work at the moment on TikTok because that's where the young people are going to for their information. And at least if they're seeing short videos about manufacturing, about apprenticeships, it will, it will, you know, they will at some point think, oh, that is something I need to investigate. But TikTok is the way forward to interact with young people. I'm going to really age myself here, but I find TikTok so short. Yeah. It's very difficult to actually provide an insight into the world of engineering because yeah. there's so much to engineering. Um, but, you know, maybe uh, Gen Zs can educate me on on how to package things um, in short form because... Uh, you know, I think it's very much about providing an insight into where things are with engineering, because it's not necessarily an industry that young people gravitate towards. No. We um, partnered with a local grime artist and he wrote a song for us about engineering and manufacturing. And then we got our apprentices to star in that. And we got 380,000 views on TikTok for that, which was amazing for, for like manufacturing and engineering. But sometimes we have to like look, you're just looking at different and ways to just attract and get them thinking about it. Yeah. So, I mean, in terms of a career choice for young people, um, and I, I'm, I guess I'm talking more to girls and women rather than, boys because I think boys still do gravitate yeah. towards that kind of engineering if they are that way inclined um engineering isn't such a major no-no for them but for sort of girls and women um why would it be an attractive industry for them it's just it is such a creative and um varied career for young people but they need to see those relatable role models which is what we work really hard on so only 3% of our intake this year is female, which is the lowest we've ever had. Wow. Yeah. Backwards. Not yeah, backwards. yeah. And I think that's a lot to do with COVID and we weren't in the schools and there wasn't a lot going on. When I was at Jaguar Land Rover, they had a very low intake of female apprentices. So we developed a program called Young Women in the Know and we invited young girls in year 10 and 11 to come and spend a week at the centre when during their school holidays. And they met females within the sector. They went and did two days work experience out within the factory. And after three years, when I left, 55% of the intake was female, which was amazing. The best they've ever had. 
So, um, so that's the thing. If wow. you're dispelling those myths and you're bringing them into this environment, they think is intimidating, but they can see firsthand that it's not. And it's, you know, there's lots of opportunities there. I think that really helps. We did, a, we do a future makers show once a year at Millennium Point. And we invite young people from Birmingham and Sully Hull to it. And we do a lot of video and Q and A, but it's ensuring that everyone on that platform is representing the audience. And Aisha, she's one of our young female um, Asian apprentices. She got up and she spoke about her welding and everything. And then these group of girls came up to us afterwards and they were like, we never thought we could do something like that. We didn't think we'd be able to do engineering. So it's creating those relatable role models. You know, you can't be what you can't see. And seeing that people are having successful, varied, interesting careers And that's what's going to really encourage more girls into the sector. Dare I ask, what kind of personalities would make a good um, person in manufacturing? You know, are there certain character traits that you see um, more frequently? You um, you have to be comfortable being in a male dominated environment at the moment, and I think that's the thing. So we do a lot of work with scout groups. We do sessions in the evenings because scouts is boys and girls, and it's girls who are used to being with boys. We've also sponsored um, girls teams in male dominated sports. So we sponsor a girls rugby team, a girls football team. So it's and we're saying not to be limited by your gender. So it's those kind of young people who are like, I don't care what anybody thinks. It does at the moment, unfortunately, have to be that kind of young person who's quite strong and a little bit resilient because at the moment they will be in the minority. And when you are in the minority, you can feel self-conscious and you can feel, you know, that you're standing out and being looked at more. So as it is, you have to be strong, unfortunately, at the moment to be coming through. But as this progresses and we get more females, that won't necessarily be an issue. You know, you're exactly describing the motivation for starting this podcast, Um, because as an engineer, I think maybe the expectation of my audience was you're an engineer. You should be talking about engineering. And instead, I did what was considered to be a soft, soft skills podcast. Um, Yeah where women talk about themselves and their experiences and what they've learned and what they can pass on to anyone who feels underrepresented. And what you've just said there exactly describes why I really felt compelled to have a podcast like this, because um, women do need to feel a sense of empowerment and they need to find a place where they develop resilience because the truth is that engineering is male dominated yeah. right now it yeah. probably will be male dominated for a, for a while yeah and um i really feel that women need a boost um and motivation and inspiration to exist in a male dominated environment and I needed that. I needed that when I graduated into engineering. I needed a place where I could be proudly a woman and not try and be like a man in a man's world and just just like learn to develop a sense, a strong sense of self rather than trying to change myself to fit. Um, and so I'm so happy that you've said that because that is exactly why um, I, 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 I love the conversations we have on this podcast. So with that said, um, what can you personally share um, that would help women thinking about going into male-dominated industries that will kind of boost their resilience and empowerment? Well, we had, so it was International Women's Day last week, and we had an event where we had um, 70 women from within manufacturing in the room, and we had a guest panel and guest speakers, and it was a really empowering, positive event, because we've all experienced it, you've all had the little comments and the little, you know, 
are you the note taker and the assumptions within the the sector and that was really really thought provoking and then we also had the comments during the day when we were posting about it what about international men's day and why is you know and it's and it's not about that and it's about the men understanding and, and I think there is a change in that and I think the men need to understand that we are there as an, on an equal merit and I think that's some of the issues that you sometimes have that they thought the girl's there as the token girl and she's not there as the token girl she's got there on her own merit and that is really difficult for some of our female apprentices because they you know they feel like they have to go above and beyond to justify why they're there and they shouldn't have to. They should just be themselves because they've got there and they are just, go, you know, they're exactly the same as the boys, but there is often that, you know, concern that they have to be different and they just need to be the, their authentic selves because that's what's been, that's why they've been selected and that's why they're going through. So it's just, but just being, a, I think if you're aware that there will be, some comments and there will be, and it is improving and there are fantastic men out there supporting and empowering females in the sector but it's it's just not letting that affect you which can be really hard as a 16 year old girl and I think you know it's it, so we do we have groups and we do um sessions at the center about self-esteem but and then I think when we utilize those females to showcase to other younger females, that's even more empowering for them because they can see that they're making a difference to the sector in the long term because they're that face and they're a couple of years older than the young girl at school. And they're like, well, they can do it. I can do it. And then when they see that the impact they're having, that's really inspiring for them. I mean, we're touching on something so fundamentally important. Yeah. Um, because, gosh, I mean, how to contain it in a sentence or two? But it's like um, International Women's Day and days that celebrate women yeah. and celebrate people who are underrepresented is not designed to dominate or overpower or um, muscle our way through yeah. to the top. These days are actually designed to provide awareness yeah. to the dominant group yeah. that we need not acknowledgement, but like we just need to be treated equally. Yeah, yeah, that's it, yeah. And and so, you know, yes, we don't have an International Men's Day, but why not? Because well, we do, we do in November. So there is an International Men's Day, and we do do stuff about International Men's Day, but it doesn't get the same platform as the Females Day because it doesn't need to get the same platform as the Females Day because we need to attract more women to these sectors and everything. But the men are already in these sectors, so we aren't needing to highlight it and showcase it because they're already dominant, but there is an International Men's Day, but then they don't do anything to celebrate it. So they should own it themselves and do, put events on themselves. Well, that's what is kind of, has been unsaid for decades, which is that um, men really do help other men. Yeah. That's been my experience, that men help each other you know, there is this kind of locker room banter, this kind of pumping up of each other and, you know, networks where they they pass on jobs that, you know, they know exist. And, and there's just been this real camaraderie. And women don't have that, which is why, um, you know, I started this podcast and why th there's been an absolute influx of networking, celebrating days, acknowledging um, different groups, because the networks have not existed. Yeah. And when you feel like you are the only one yeah. doing something, you, it can be so alienating. And it's not like the token woman um can do this alone yeah. you know no no man has done this alone yeah 
And so these days are an opportunity to bring those smaller numbers yeah. of groups together and just say, listen, help each other. Yeah. And and there's been like a bit of um whilst all of that positive stuff is going on, there's also been this kind of uh need to um take the edge of the competitiveness because for example the, there has been a few places for women allocated to kind of try and even the numbers up but then because of those few seats that have been allocated um within uh underrepresented groups there is a danger of competition because yeah. it's like, oh my gosh, there's only three seats at a table of 10 for women, let's just say. Like, I want to be that woman because I've yeah. worked really hard to get there. And so I think by growing these networks and by celebrating these days, um, women's skills and accomplishments um, and and right to be there means that co- competition will somehow decrease because it will be less about we need to place that woman in that only seat at the table and actually it will be more about um we need that person with those skills yeah so let's just you know and it will start to just balance out and it has to balance out and you know we need more girls we need more diversity overall because you know, you go into events within manufacturing, it's predominantly white middle-aged men and we need to push the age profiler, we need to increase diversity and we need more women represented because it needs to, it needs to change. Yeah. And all these events, all these um, initiatives, groups, all of that need to just keep doing what they're doing um, because I think eventually uh, it will start to break through Um, I mean, even across this conversation, we've gone from, so why do you need diversity to now a place in the conversation where we're like, we absolutely need diversity. It's not even a debate, you know. Um, And I think on a macroscopic scale, we're still trying to make that transition from doing things the way we've always done them to actually seeing the benefits of doing things differently. Luckily, young people are more confident these days in terms of they won't stand for, it's just the way it's always been. They will question things and they will go, well, no, it shouldn't be like that. And that is what I think will really, really help. They are pushing the boundaries far more than has ever been done before. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think uh, standing back, as maybe an older generation um, would help with that because we're trying to impose the way we've seen things um, and it's clouding the way things need to evolve. Um, And so giving younger people a voice, I think um, can only be a positive thing. Even though we have lots of experience, it's also valuable. Yeah. Um, I think it's good to see things through fresh eyes. Um, Getting a bit more personal, um, as a woman in STEM um, and a woman who is in a male-dominated kind of world, how has it been for you juggling womanhood? You know, do you have um, any sort of like, um, not experiences, but sort of uh, lifestyle uh traits that you can share with us that maybe a lot of women also uh, experience and kind of the juggle i want to talk about the juggle for you personally the guilt so <laughs> i yeah it is it can be it, it was very daunting being a female within manufacturing when i first started and the culture within manufacturing wasn't very accepting of females and you had all the comments and everything. But that, thankfully, has progressed massively over the last 20 years. But also being a mother and having to deal with that and, you know, with juggling your life, but you don't want to be seen to be, well, I can't do that because I've got this responsibility and I've got to be there for that. So you often hid it and it, you had to just try and, and then you felt like you were letting everybody down. But 
you then overcompensate in other areas. So it was a lot to do with the juggling is the guilt, whereas a man wouldn't have those issues. And it was very much assumed that was the, the woman to do. And you're trying to do all this and but not let it impact or affect you because they were just waiting for it to impact and affect you. And I think, unfortunately, that's why a lot of female engineers don't come back after maternity because they don't think it's possible to be able to do a STEM career and the hours that are associated with that and the inflexibility often that's associated with that and be uh, a mother as well. But then you want to be inspiring to your children and you want them to see that, you know, you don't have to stop. You can continue and you can do and you want to do both. You want to be making an impact within life and having a career and also bringing young children up and letting them see what's available to them. And that is changing. And I think policies are changing around that. Jaguar Land Rover are fantastic. They give 12 months full pay for their um, maternity and they have nurseries on site because they realise they can't invest in these apprentices, skill them up, they have children and they don't come back. They need them back within the sector. So big companies are able to do that. I appreciate SMEs, not necessarily but it's supporting those females so that you don't lose them because you need them within the roles and you need that flexibility. And I think that's helping as well nowadays. There is more flexibility for females and for males now, because that's the other thing. Males want to do childcare and help out and do school runs and everything. And luckily they're now able to say, I have these other commitments, but I can still do that as well. It's such a knock on effect, isn't it? Because uh, back in my day, um, the kind of idea that you have children was very much a woman's problem. Yeah. Um, but the fact that companies are now showing an emphasis on paternity leave yeah. makes men realise that actually they have a role to play yeah. in parenthood. You're not just there for the moment of concern. Yeah. You know, it is a long-term yeah. commitment. And it's making people um, factor that into their decision-making process because when two people want to have a child, um, I think it's not just, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll have kids and I'll continue to be ambitious in my career. It's like, I want children because I want the experience of being a parent and what that means for at least 18 years, you know? And so um, I think... Uh, Companies making moves in the direction of supporting parenthood on both sides, maternal yeah. and maternal, is having a societal impact. Yeah. Um, and that's so powerful um, because, you know, it would be so nice to get to a point where women aren't having to make the decision by themselves. Yeah. Um, I don't have children because I uh, got to the point where I was thinking, I don't want to like take that time out yeah. of my career to have children, even though I'd love to be a mum, you know? And so it's like, I had to make a sacrifice. And why is it only a woman yeah. to have that debate in her own head? You know, why isn't it a joint decision with, but I think that's, very much changing as you say um the landscape of all of that is changing in a very powerful way and you mentioned a word that i think is probably the word of this conversation which is hiding yeah um women are starting to move into an era where they don't have to hide who they are i just think that's amazing yeah no definitely Definitely. And, you know, and we, we, we bring so many skills. This is the thing. I don't think it's appreciated yet the difference it will make when there is parity because the skills and the difference, we are different. Men and women are different. So what we bring to the party will have a massive impact. Yes. Well, I don't think there's anything left to be said because there's so much left to be said. You know, it's like we've opened the can of worms. Yeah. We, it's it's a Pandora's box of discussions and debates that span many levels of um, 
societal change. I think the issues that we bring up on this podcast um, are very complex and interwoven. But thank you so much for today kind of making it so clear that even if we don't quite understand why um, we should be considering STEM um, because of the the hangover that it's a male-dominated industry, what has been really clear today is the absolute positive effect of contributing to a diverse future. Um, and so even if you're like, oh, I'm not sure if STEM's for me, I don't know if I can code, it seems really masculine, do it anyway. Yeah. Because this is an industry that will welcome you because yeah. they so desperately need diversity. Yeah. So that's really the message that has come through loud and clear um, in talking to you today. Thank you so much for providing that light and that insight. No, that's great. And it's just young people making informed decisions. Even if they don't want to do it, at least they know what they're turning off from. But I think when they give it a go, they'll realise that the world's their oyster and they've got loads of opportunity. Mic drop. Love that. Thanks for listening and please do subscribe to this podcast and maybe even rate and review it if you can. The more ratings and reviews and the more interest from those trusty algorithms, which could help to increase the reach of this show. And you can watch the video recording of this conversation on YouTube for my new series called Esteemed Women. It's all about self-discovery and self-evolution on innovation. So as always, be kind and loving to yourselves and I wish you all a great week.